Um, I was talking about what knowing is, that when you know, you're convinced, you're certain of something, you're in close contact with somebody or the person that you know or the thing that you know, you're in direct connection. And so when we talk of knowing the Father, it consists of all these things. Uh, as I was thinking about this, reading the um, these definitions of knowing, my mind went into research. Uh, when we talk of research, we, we talk of looking for knowledge. We, we want to build a body of knowledge when we are doing research. And that is the, 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 the image that came into my mind, that when you want to know, to build knowledge about somebody or about uh, something, you you um you 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 study them you you spend time with them you do inquiries you obtain information but also when it is somebody that you want to know you have and develop a relationship with them and so when we want to know the father it's through spending time with him and meeting with him that we are able uh to know just as we don't know people or things through casual or distant observation, we uh, we also we also can't know God when we just observe Him or get or hear about Him from secondhand information. We can't know the Father by just occasionally hearing about Him or gathering Him information about him once in a while uh, knowing the father requires us to to closely observe and interact with him regularly speak to him and allow him to speak to us as we listen to someone share with us their ideas so if you want to know somebody uh, you you spend time with them you listen to them as they share with you their ideas their desires their innermost thoughts, that is when you're able to form a better picture of who they are. And as I was meditating on this, I, I thought about married people. Uh, people who are married will tell you that the person that they thought they married turned out to be different when they finally had the chance to live under the same roof day and night. For some, it turns out to be a pleasant experience as the person turns out to be better than they expected or what they had observed when they were dating. But for others, it turns out to be an unpleasant experience when the person turns out to be the opposite of what they had depicted while they were dating. We all know that during dating times, people can put on a show, but when you are only meeting somebody only occasionally and in specific circumstances, you don't really get to know them until you get to live with them under the same roof day and night. And so it's the same thing uh, with God. Uh, if we want to know him, we need to be able to spend time with him. And uh, then the definition of a father is that a father is an originator or creator. Uh, we, this was interesting to me because I think I've always imagined the father as the father is the male person in a in a family, but the fatherhood is a character of a mentor, a provider relationship, and this is the the role and name that God has in relation to all the people that He has created. Uh, one crea uh, Christian writer has stated that the father is a male who has begotten a child one who gives origin to a generator. And he states that God as a father is a great cause, the cause of all life and all being. And the word father from the Hebrew language is the word Abba. And in the Greek language, it's the word Heta, uh, both meaning they have the idea of a source and a sustainer. So a father is not just a father, who is responsible for bringing somebody or something into existence, he must also sustain it. He provides support, he provides nourishment, 
He provides the foundation for all that he brings forth. So you find uh, this is why some sometimes you find people are they they co are called fathers, but they are not really sustaining what they brought forth. And so to be a father, according to this definition, is to be a source of a thing, but it's also to be its sustainer. And in this sense, God is the father of all that he has created. Uh, I know that we who believe, uh, we say God is our father, but also because he has created everything, he has created, he's the source and the originator of all of us. He's also the father of all, including non-believers, when you th look at it from this perspective. Not only is he our creator, he also sustains and upholds everything in this world by his word of power. But in another sense, God is the father of all of us who believe in Christ Jesus. For we read in John chapter 1, verse 12, that to all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he has given the power or the right to become children of God. So God has adopted those who believe in Jesus in his family. And scripture is full of references to God as the father. Yeah, if you look at Deuteronomy 32.6, I won't be able to read most of these references because of time. But if you get time, you can read them. Second Samuel 7.14. Psalm 2 verse 7, Isaiah 9, 6, Matthew 6, 9, Matthew 11, 27, Matthew 28, 9, John 4, 21, and Acts 13, 33. And in our passage today, it may not, it doesn't specifically mention him as a father, but it says that we are his offspring, which means that he's our father. And uh, we are told in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, that we have not received the spirit that makes us fearful slaves. Instead, we have received God's spirit when he adopted us as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. God has adopted us who believe in Jesus into his family. And in turn, we have gained all the rights uh, that, uh, we, that are given to people who are in a family. So you don't only, you can ask for the rights to be the heir, you can be given an inheritance in, the, in your new father's estate. And so that's what happens to us when we become Christians, when we become believers in Christ, we gain the privileges and responsibilities of a child in the family of God. And as our father, he becomes our source of everything. The one who originates or institutes us. He's the one from whom everything and any, everything, everyone exists. And so he becomes our source of everything. And in our passage today, it was in Acts 17, we read just a small portion. It's a long passage. Paul was speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens at the Areopagus. And he, he was trying to get them to understand that all the other gods that they had, they had all these images that he looked at and he got very concerned and his heart was troubled. But he also saw one, uh, one image that was uh, like the, the, an altar or an unknown God. And so he was telling them that this unknown God is the God that he was preaching to them. And he highlights several attributes of God, which, pro, uh, which portray God as the source and sustainer. And those same attributes are relevant to us, the hearers in 21st century. And we need to be convinced of them and to know about him. The first one is that God made the world and everything in it. That's what he says in verse 24, that God made the world and everything in it. He is the source. Now, many of us think this is, uh, this is obvious, uh, especially those of us who have grown up in the church in the uh, you, we've been told god is our source but some people 
don't believe that this is the case, or they may not believe that it is so, but it doesn't matter. There are many things, people in the world who think that the world came out of an explosion, that there is a big bang that happened. And so as I, I prepared this, I thought, let me just Google and see what people say and uh, what is written about how the world came into being. And I came upon this newsletter uh, from Chicago University that says, the earth formed over 4.6 billion years ago out of a mixture of dust and gas around the young sun. It grew larger thanks to the countless collisions between dust particles, asteroids, and other growing planets including one last giant impact that threw enough rock, gas, and dust into space to form the moon. And then the National Geographic also had some interesting theories of how the world came to be. And I, as I read all this, I was like, where is God? Okay, God may have used all that, but why aren't they mentioning God? There's nothing, absolutely no mention about God in these, in these ones. Uh, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what the word of God says. It tells us that the world and everything in it was made by God. As it says in Genesis chapter 1, but also we read in Psalm 24 verse 1 that God uh, made everything that is, that is uh, on earth and in heaven. And also as we see in Acts 17, 24. And this makes God the father of all things, since he's the source and he's the origin of everything. He created us in his image and he expects us as his offsprings to be like him. And in Isaiah 63 verse 16, we are told, for you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from all is your name. And in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it says that there is one God, the Father from whom all things are and for whom they exist, one Lord Jesus Christ. This is our Father and our God. He is the source. He's the owner of everything. Isaiah 64, verse 7 reminds us that he made us. We are the clay and he's the porter. We are all the work of his hands. Even from this perspective, every, every human being, even those who don't acknowledge God, even those who don't believe in Jesus, they are begotten of God. We are all his offspring. He is the father of all mankind, no matter whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And then the, the other thing that I saw from, from this passage about God the Father is that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. We see this in verse 24. That the Father is the, the God is, he made everything and he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Sometimes people have wishful thinking and especially those who prefer not to believe in God. They think that God's power and his authority, if at all it is there, is limited to heaven. They assume that he has no, no jurisdiction, no authority here on earth. And they think that the earth belongs to people and that God can't make any intervention. That is why they live as they wish and they live like God doesn't exist. They think that he doesn't concern himself with what is material here. Or if they think he's concerned, they are not concerned. But it's not true that God is not concerned about what is here. He's the creator of heaven and earth and he's Lord of both heaven and earth. He rules over the whole universe. And our father's rule and authority is not just contained in heaven, but it also reaches here on earth. And I believe this is why Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, said, we pray, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because earth belongs to him and he rules both here on earth and in heaven. Nothing happens without his knowledge or his permission. And sometimes 
it may look like Satan is the Lord of have, of of us he, because he has taken uh, over control over the systems of the earth. Sometimes it looks like uh, some people seem to think that Satan is Lord, and they sometimes even magnify him or put him at a certain pedestal as if he's almost like God here on earth. But he is not. He's much, much lower than God. He is just one ruler uh, that was thrown on earth, but he is not the Lord of the earth. Jesus is Lord. God is the Lord of heaven and earth. We, that's what, the other thing that we really need to understand about our Father, that he, not only is he the creator of heaven and earth, he's also the Lord of heaven and earth. And the third thing that I get from this passage is that God does not live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs because God has no needs. Uh, this is what NLT puts it like, that he doesn't live in man-made temples, human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. But the New International Version states that he does not live in temples built by hands and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. God does not need anything from us. He has all that he needs and he doesn't live in human-made temples. When I, read, when I was reading this, I, I, I was thinking about us at, at All Saints Cathedral. For many years, we've been constructing a magnificent cathedral and we are all looking forward to using it before this year ends. But I was also thinking about the magnificent cathedrals, the impressive church buildings that uh, uh, were built in the, in the Western countries in the past as places of worship. S some of these have since been abandoned as believers in, this, in these places have dwindled in number and the buildings have been turned into mosques, markets and others and people I've seen people get agitated about this and they, they think, oh, what a terrible thing, which is a terrible thing, obviously, because it means that fewer people have the knowledge of Christ, have the light of Christ. While it is great to have magnificent buildings uh, where we gather to worship, we should never fall into the error of thinking that God dwells in these places. It is very clear that God doesn't live in man-made temples. When he comes, he inhabits us, his people, his temples. We know that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit and God lives in us. And so when he's in us and we gather in these places of worship, he meets with us in these places, but it's not his dwelling. He cannot be contained in one place, as it says in, in, the, in the word of God. The buildings are for our benefit. They protect us from the sun, the wind, the rain, and anything else, but they are not for God's benefit. We should never ever think, ah, I'm building this, I'm contributing to our construction, I'm doing God a favor. No, we are not doing God a favor by uh, adding to SCP or anything. We are actually doing ourselves a favor to have a place where we can gather to worship. God needs nothing from us. He doesn't need anything from us. He has no need. And so even when our human hands are being used, because sometimes God uses us, he may choose our human hands to do his work here on earth. But even then, it's not for his benefit. It is for the sake of other people. It, may, it will not be for the sake of meeting God's need, for he needs nothing, uh, as, as we see. And then fourthly, the other thing, the fourth thing that I got from these verses in verse 25b tells us that he himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. God gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. The New, uh, New International Version says he gives men life and breath and everything else. He, he gives life and breath and everything else. Again, it is God, it is Father who supplies all our needs. Every living thing, including men and women, we get our life and breath from our Father. 
He's the sustainer of our lives. That day that he decides to take away life or breath of our creature, no amount of human intervention is likely to make a difference. Uh, you can go to the hospital, you can go to the best hospital that have the best facilities, but if God has said, this is your day, I'm taking away your life, no doctor can do anything. No machine can do anything. And I said, what a wonderful God. What a powerful God we have. What a powerful Father we have. Likewise, no matter what people or other forces may do to take away someone's life, somebody may plan and plot to take away your life. But if it is not aligned to the will of God, it will not happen. Because the Lord is the one who gives us life. The Lord is the one who gives us breath. No one else can make a claim on our life. He alone gives us life. Even our parents, much as they are the ones who brought us on this earth, they can't lay a claim for having given us life. They were just vessels used by God to bring us on this earth. But this life that I have, was manufactured by God. It was not my mother. It was not my father. He just used them as vessels. So those of us who are parents and we have children, we better realize that this life that we've given uh, is, is not, it's, we, we just were used by God as vessels. And in the same way, no one has a mandate to, to take away your life. No one has mandate to take away life unless given permission by God, the source of life. If God doesn't give somebody permission, they cannot take away your life. So if you want life and breath, don't get tempted to try and get it apart from God. You're wasting your time. Uh, there are many people who go to great lengths to extend their lives, but ultimately God takes it away. And that is the end of it. I also Googled to see how do you extend life? And there were so many things about don't smoke, have, do exercise, do good, do all the, you know, all the things that we are given as the things that we should do to extend our lives. But ultimately, if you can do all those things, eat a healthy diet, do exercise, sleep early, do not smoke, don't take alcohol, don't fight. All those things that we know, that we are told. But if God does not give you life, if he says today is the last day of your life, you go. In Psalm 104 verse 21, we read that the lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. It is God who, as, as well as giving us life, who meets our every need. He satisfies our every need not just our needs as human beings, but also the needs of animals. So where do you look for, for your needs to be met? Where do you look to have life? Where do you put your faith as far as life is concerned? My prayer is that we should not be foolish. We should be wiser than animals. Because even a lion looks to God for food. The, the land looks to God for life. They know the appropriate place to look for their sustenance. God the Father who meets our every need. Unfortunately for us human beings, we tend to think we are wiser. We look to other people. We look to our parents. We look to our friends. We look to the government uh, because we think that they are the ones who are supposed to meet our needs. But the Lord uh, makes it very clear uh, in this verse 25 of Acts 17 that he's the one who gives us life, he's the one who gives us breath, he's the one who satisfies our every need. We should not try to look for satisfaction in other things, in other places, because they will never be sufficient. These people whom we go to, our parents, people who love us, our friends, they will never fit the shoes of God because it's only God who satisfies our every need. They are going to disappoint us if our hope is in them, if we expect uh, them to be the ones to 
provide for us to meet our needs. And the last thing that Paul talks about in this passage is that God created all the nations throughout the whole earth from one man. We all originate from the one man, Adam. And we are told that God created them so that the nations should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them <clears throat> and exact places where they should live. And as I read these words, I thought, wow, what a powerful God and Father we have. None of us can determine which nation, which nationality you will be when we are born, where we will be found. None of us. I know when we grow old, we can decide to change, change, go to live in another place, go to another continent and all that. But where we are, where we are born, and even when we change, I believe it is still where God has determined that we should be. God has determined which age we should uh, in which age we should occupy the places we are we are we are we occupy. So some of us may have wanted to be here in the 18th century, but God determined that we would be here in the 20th and 21st century. Some of us would have loved to be here in the 30th century, but not many of us who are here will make it that. Uh, to that 30th century. Yes. God. What about a couple of people? Yes. God has determined uh, the times. He has determined the places uh, that we occupy. And it was determined long ago. That's how powerful our God is. He is the, the father who has decided where we shall be. He decided which exact place you and I would occupy on this planet Earth. He determined which decade you'd be born and in which one you'll be departing this, this Earth. He has determined, he already has in his plans when your life will come to an end and there is nothing you can do about it. There is nothing anyone else can do about it much as they would like to. And the reason? And as, as it says, it is that we would seek after him, we would perhaps feel our way toward him, and we would find him. I thought that I found that very comforting, that he determined long ago, created all nations, and he created them so that we would inhabit the earth, and he determined the time set for us, he determined the exact places where we would live so that we would seek after him, so that we would feel our way toward him, so that we would find him. But it also says, although he is not far from us, this is our God. He's not some deity who dwells in some faraway corner that is an inaccessible to people. As Paul says in this passage, he's not far from from us. He's close to all of us. All of us. Sometimes we get tempted to think that God is only close to maybe the clergy, to those who, who have read the Bible very much. But in this, in this version of the Bible, it says that he's close to all of us. He's not far from us. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. In him, we exist. He is so close to us. He is not far from us. But we can't see it unless we seek after him, unless we feel our way towards him. We are his offspring. He longs for us to seek after him. He longs that we would feel our way toward him. He longs for us to find him. He longs to reveal himself to us. Our theme for the month says we've got revelation. Uh, <clears throat> it says uh, uh, revel the revelation of God. He longs, he longs, he longs to reveal himself to you. He longs that you make your way toward him. Just like any loving father would want his children to be close to him. Just like any loving father would want his children to spend time with him and to be like him. 
You know, men will be very happy when they are told your son resembles you. So is our God. He desires that we will be like him. He, re he desires that we would reach out to him. He is waiting expectantly for us to walk towards him, to feel our way towards him. He desires that we find him. I found this very encouraging and comforting. Sometimes it feels like God is so far away. It feels like God has hidden himself and you have to pray and spend hours and years and months before you can find him. But God is very near to us and he desires for us to find him. And so in, in view of this, how are we then to live? How should we live? One of the things that we need to do is that we should seek after God. We should seek to know him, seek to know this father of ours, the source of our, the one from whom we, uh, we, we originate, but also the one in whom we live and move and have our being. The word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, that in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so God has, has revealed, already revealed himself to us. He speaks to us. But we just need to pay attention. We need to seek after him. He has spoken to us by his son, but also, and then we also know that his son is the word. As we read in John chapter one, verse one to five, it says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So my prayer is that we will all personally search the scriptures, personally, not wait for somebody else to tell you secondhand information, but personally search the scriptures and let God reveal himself to you through his word. Let the Father reveal his fatherhood to you through his word as you spend time with him. Many of us want to spend time with the Father, but most of the time we want to tell him about ourselves. You know, you can have a friend who may, who you, maybe when you've just got to know each other, they are always telling you about themselves, but they don't let you talk about yourself. And so they will never know you. You'll know them, but you don't know them. So it's the same with our Father. He also needs to speak. He, he, we need to let him speak to us. And so we need, many of us need to make an adjustment when we come to God in our time with him. We spend the time with God studying his word and speaking less. It's very easy to go to God and start speaking, telling him about ourselves. But let us start to listen to pay attention to what he says. You will be amazed at what you will discover about the Father as you pay attention to him. So spend time with God and listen to what he has to say. His word is very clear. But also allow the word of God to form your thinking. Be diligent to study the word of God, but allow the word of God to, to transform who you are because if God is your source, if the word of God says he meets all your needs, he's the one who is your life, then live as a person who knows that my father is the source of all life. My father gives me breath. My father meets all my needs. You can't live like that and then start to steal public money and then start to deceive people. You, your life will be transformed 
as you know who your father is because you want to be like your father. You know that your father wants you to be like him. And so you can't live, you can't do things that are contrary to what the word of God says. But you also need to be able to believe that what God says is what is true. Uh, there are many people who read the word of God, but they also say, ah, that one, I'm not so sure that God meant that. Uh, you can interpret it in many ways. And that's why we ended up with people who claim to be believers, but their lives are contrary to what God says. My prayer is that we will know that God's word is real and we will live according to it. But finally, we should also acknowledge God as the source of everything. If you acknowledge God, if you know that God is the source of everything, your life will be very different from those who live like they are the source of everything or somebody else is the source of everything. My prayer is that we will all get to the point of knowing Father as our source of everything. And so in that way, be able to live lives that are a resemblance of our Father so that we can bring honor and glory to him. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the revelations that you've given uh, to us. I pray, Father, that you help us to know you uh, because many times we think that we know you, but we, we, we live like we don't know you. I pray, Father, that you help us to really understand you and to live lives that reflect the God who is our Father, the God who is the source, the God who, the, who gives everything, who is Lord over everything. May we allow you to be Lord in our lives, in every aspect of our lives, the private and the public, the ones that people see, the ones that we, the, that we show up at church with, the ones that the, our lives that we show up at work with, the lives of Lord that we show up in our homes with, Lord. May you be Lord and Father, may your name be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Professor Liz. This has been a complete menu, and I will not add anything, but just to encourage ourselves that we need to take this word as our meal for today, digest it, and allow the Lord to reveal to us himself so that we can know him as a father, our sustainer and everything that we need is in him. When we find him, we find life, we find satisfaction, and we find prosperity that we seek in other places. Uh, may God bless you, Professor Liz, and I, let's pray for Professor for the time the wisdom, the revelation that we've received. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this word. We receive it with thanksgiving. Oh Lord, we receive it with open hearts and we are thanking you for Professor Liz. We commit her to you, O oh Lord, for the word that she has spoken, Lord, deep revelation from you. Bless her, bless her family, bless the work of her hands, bless her spiritual journey, O oh Lord, and that you will sustain her. We come against any counterattack for the lives that she has spoken to, that the enemy will not use this word against her, that you'll be her shield, watching over her going out and coming in, watching over all of her going out and coming in. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.